Welcome to the Tech Blog Writer Podcast, your guide to future tech trends and innovation in a language you understand. Now, over to your host, Neil Hughes. Welcome back to the Tech Blog Writer Podcast, where I've beamed your ears all the way to Vegas this week, where we're going to be covering the Adobe Digital Summit live from the Venetian Hotel. Now, most people say what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, but I say whatever happens in Vegas will be shared across multiple platforms and to you lovely listeners in 165 different countries. So this week, I'm going to be on the lookout for new solutions and how technology is actually transforming the customer experience. Now, not long after I arrived here, I came across a book launch called The Digital Identity Crisis. And it really caught my eye because it catalogues the evolving dimensions of individual identity, which have all emerged through the digital era. And it also looks at the challenges that businesses are facing today as a result. But it also looks at how those challenges come with unprecedented opportunity to actually forge true personal and long-lasting relationships with their customers, which go on to bridge both the digital and physical spheres. So the author is Ruli Alizarov. He's the co-founder and president of Gigia. So I invited him to step away from the show floor and talk to us today about the takeaways and themes coming out of his book. So buckle up. Hold on tight as I beam your ears all the way to Vegas so we can speak with Ruli, the co-founder and president of Gigia, to talk all about his book, The Digital Identity Crisis. So a massive warm welcome to the show. Can you tell the listeners a little about who you are and what you do? Hi, Neil and everybody. Uh, my name is Ruli Eliezerov. I'm a co-founder at Gigia, which is a, a startup with grew to be uh, already 300 people and was just acquired by SAP. Uh, And what we're doing, I'm an entrepreneur and identity in general is a subject that always was of interest uh, to me. And Gigia was an opportunity for us to uh, try and steer how digital identity is being developed uh, over the internet to the right place, I think, because, you know, technology is evolving and, you know, some people... Uh, have some criticism about you know how technology is changing culture. Some just think it's a great thing. I believe that technology is something you cannot stop. However, you can help steer it to the right directions. And uh, when it comes to identity, that's where I feel our role uh, as the founder, we're three co-founders, was uh, it was an opportunity for us to uh, to you know to do things we we believe that should be done in a certain way. Uh, And so Gigia is managing identities or digital identities for uh, large enterprises like uh, Nestle or NBC, Dell and companies like that. Um, And we can later on talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, I'm looking forward to delving a little bit deeper into that. Now, at last year's Adobe Summit, I spoke with Jason Rose from Gigia, and I believe you've undergone a few changes since we last met. Like you said, you've been acquired by SAP there. So can you tell me a little about your relationship with SAP and also what what that will mean for Gigia long term? Sure. 2017 was an amazing year for Gigia. I think also because the uh, the market and beginning from the analysts, but also uh, the market in general realized the importance of uh, the concept of identity management and how much can it be uh, can it do when you take a, a holistic approach and not just try to solve you know a registration login a cookie and here and there but a more holistic approach and and analysts began to release reports and uh, positioned Gigia um, across you know uh, multiple uh, vendors from large corporations that already provided identity solutions for enterprises, uh, for, you know, employee management and things like that, to uh, startups more like us that, that uh, created uh, solutions that are unique to customer identity management. That, that's actually an, an important distinction. We're talking about identity management for, for people like you and me out, out you know, out there uh, that are interacting with uh, companies like, you know, you buy shoes at Nike or you install the Nike running app, uh, you create an identity. So these are the kind of identities uh, we're helping managing. So during that year, there was a realization of the importance of this space of customer identity management. And as I mentioned, uh, the analysts, all three reports positioned Giga as the clear leader, the number one in that space. And uh, I think it uh, kind of uh, created some interest, more interest uh, across the large uh, companies that, that were looking into it amongst is uh, is SAP and 
the reason that we we thought SAP would be a great match for Gigia was because we shared the same vision. So what we believe, I you know, I mentioned before that we we try to steer identity and data, you know, personal data management on the internet to the right direction. We and so SAP believe that a large organization that hold and manage a lot of data about people can gain more value by doing it in a way that protects their customers. So instead of buying and selling data and you know, doing all kind of shady practices with your customers' data, we believe that there is an opportunity to do it in a trusted, uh, in, a, in a way that create trust and a, a real long-term relationship with your customers and uh, accept, uh, share the same vision. And therefore, uh, we believe that they can help us bring it to, into a really massive scale. Well, here we are at this year's Adobe Summit in Vegas in the Venetian Hotel. So what are you looking forward to most this year? And how, how would you best describe uh, the environment here? So there, it, it's interesting to see, you know, we're talking about now from the U.S. market because, yeah. you know, I, I was mentioning uh, trust and uh, relationship, which is related very much also to, uh, I think, GDPR. Uh, yeah. For the listeners that are not aware, that's a regulation that is coming up in May and going to begin to be enforced actually in May this year uh, in Europe. Uh, so we've we've re- we saw we've seen a lot of uh, interest and uh, interest from the EU market companies that that are based there. But now uh, also the United the the US market begins to realize both it's an important practice, but also you know most of the large organizations have uh, customers in in Europe, and therefore GDPR is relevant for them too. Bottom line is that. Uh, I believe that this year is going to be uh, the shift of of understanding of uh, the importance of privacy into the U.S. market too, and not only in Europe. Now, I'm also excited to see at this year's summit, of course, because I believe you're releasing a book called The Digital Identity Crisis. I mean, can you tell me more about that book? Uh, sure, yeah. That's uh, something I'm very passionate about. I've worked uh, on it for a, a, a during the whole year 2017 and it's now going to be released uh, today um, and the book is uh, is looking it's more more kind of a visionary view uh, into how a digital identity uh, evolves and what does it mean in different aspects what does it mean for us as people for us as a culture what does it mean for businesses and large organizations like government uh, and also uh, where does it go in terms of, uh, you know, as technology evolves, for example, how will artificial intelligence affect us as people once it's connected to our uh, digital identities? And there are a lot of in- I spoke with very interesting people from different areas that relate to identity, from security to privacy to business. And as I mentioned, artificial intelligence technology and very interesting things are happening, I think, mostly because and that's the, the reason I wrote this book is because I realized how much of our lives is moving into this uh, virtual space. Uh, we're not just going there to consume uh, uh, content or to play games. Uh, you know, even the fact that we're communicating more through uh, uh, messaging uh, and less, I don't know if less through voice, but at least we, we're increasing the amount of communication we're doing uh, through messaging, which, which is a digital uh, way to communicate. and. I don't know if all of us realize, but one of the reasons we're doing it is because it helps us in an, it's a better way uh, to help you design your identity. So when I speak with you right now, I don't have the time to plan every word that I'm saying. However, when I'm messaging with you, people are really investing time in, you know, many times in every word they're writing, or even when do they choose to look at the message because they know the other person knows when they watch the message. So digital, uh, or technology in general is um, is more and more connected to our identity and uh, who we are. Now, as soon as we're talking about digital identities and data, I mean, we must talk about the privacy round that's actually surrounding Facebook at the moment and just refusing to go away. I mean, do you think the days of tech companies self-regulating themselves will soon disappear as a result of this? Actually, I I think you know maybe I will go to the to the bottom line. I think that actually people will trust. With time, people will trust more the large companies like Google and even Facebook at some point uh, and Apple than they trust governments. And maybe not all governments, but 
you know, I can give you many examples of governments like from Mexico to China, obviously, but even less extreme than China, that uh, that people trust more, uh, uh, trust the, the, the large companies they have accounts with more than they trust their government. Um, in terms of the trend, so I think that there is a lot, and Facebook specifically is a very sensitive position because they really have so much information about you and they need to be ultra careful about how to manage privacy. I think they invest a lot uh, because they understand the risk they have. I think that the the market or people in general uh, are very, and activists especially, especially, very sensitive and are looking into Facebook with a very, very, uh, in a way that, that that it will be very hard for Facebook to uh, to do things in the, in the right way, be, both because they're being watched so carefully, but also because uh, they hold so much information. So I think that the intentions, uh, I actually, you know, believe that the intentions of, uh, you know, at least Facebook and Google uh, are, are good. Uh, but it's but they're in a very tough uh, situation. Um, I think that they will just need to uh, learn more and more um, how to how to handle the, the the power that they have. But I think the trend will be that people continue to share, people continue to use these platforms as long as they uh, provide value. I think that with time, these uh, large organizations will be able to uh, offer more value for uh, for the data they receive. I give you an example with Alexa, for example, uh, Amazon's Alexa, and since it's such a success, Google uh, came out with Google Home and and Apple with the uh, HomePod, which for those who don't know, it's a, it's a speaker you have at home, which is actually a small computer. You can give it commands. Uh, it's connected to the internet and. For example, you know you can ask what's the weather. You can ask to play uh, some music. Um, you can you can purchase items. So uh, I think that it, we're not so far from the point where uh, these devices will be able, through uh, data um, collection and uh, and analysis, uh, to give a much more value if they were able to listen not only to when you give commands but to everything that is going on in your home. And if you ask someone. Now, whether they would enable such a device to listen and record everything that is going on in their, you know, in their <laughs> rooms, yeah. they might say no. But if uh, this device could save their lives or identify you know, cancer before uh, anyone else or give a different kind of very high value, then I think they would consider it more positively. So I think that this is the trend. It will take time until, you know, we get to a point where uh, you know, we, we let machines listen to everything that we're doing and recording it. But since the value will increase, the sharing of data with these organizations will increase too. That's my prediction. Yeah, I do think it will take time. And there are a lot of challenges ahead. But I think it's also equally important to point out the unprecedented opportunities out there, especially to forge truly personal, lasting relationships with customers, which will actually bridge both the digital and those physical spheres. I mean, can you tell me more how you explore these opportunities and ideas in your new book? Yes. So um, I think it begins with the fact that uh, or large companies understand the opportunity they have right now. So the opportunity is that people spend much more time with devices uh, or connected in general, and and uh, companies begin to see the, the opportunity to engage with them more. And as I mentioned before, create this more deep uh, trust-based relationship. So let's take uh, an example of EU Rail, the the rail uh, the transfer transfer uh, transport company the trans all the rails for uh, in Europe there had until recently they had a website where you're just buying uh, tickets from point A to point B and now they actually created communities of travelers so people are spending time even if they don't ever buy tickets there uh, they get value for, and therefore they're more uh, attached to the EU rail brand they have an identity there they have um, you know their old you know maybe reputation across the uh, uh, the community uh, there that they uh, invest and and engage more, or we can take a uh, you know another example of uh, a luxury uh, uh, watches uh, manufacturer that uh, that not only sells or present the, what they sell on the internet, but they also provide for those who uh, who invest so much money in buying a watch, 
these people are more, you know, are interested in more than just the the item in in this maybe the philosophy behind it, the technology behind it, how it's being made, and uh, this company is creating uh, content around what they produce, and and uh, people are much more engaged with the brand. It's not just one-time action of buying, you know, the item and then disappearing. So, uh, and of course, when we talk, you know, of companies like car manufacturers, like Toyota, that, uh, you know, when, when the item, the, the product itself is, is smart and connected, then you can increase the engagement with the customers through, you know, if you now move, you want to buy a new car, then all the settings of the old car can automatically be applied to the new one, which incentivizes you to stick with the brand. But overall, the point is that brands understand they have an opportunity to engage much more with their audience directly and create this kind of relationship. Uh, on the other hand, it's not so simple because companies, I mentioned Nestle, which is a Giga customer and has hundreds of brands uh, across dozens of countries. And, and they had uh, traditionally uh, managed all these, you know, they already had websites for each of their chocolate brands or or cornflakes or dog's food, they're manufacturing a lot of things, but it's all uh, siloed. So they, 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 don't know, they don't have a one customer view across all their properties. And they're using solutions like Giga to connect all those properties into one customer database that not only gets this data uh, across the properties, but also which gives the, the users great experience they don't need to fill in uh, forms again. They have single sign-on across everything. They don't need to log in every to every website they go. But also, it helps with uh, what you know. We spoke about the privacy concerns, so it's much easier to manage the privacy of your customers when you have when you know where all the data is and you can uh, control it easily. I think when we talk about privacy, the two most important concepts about privacy, and that's how GDPR is also looking at it, are transparency and control. So as long as customers know what you collect about them and they have the ability to control it, meaning I want, I allow you to use this for that, but I don't allow you to use this data for, I don't know, advertising, or I want you to delete this data, or I want to download this data and get it to, to use it somewhere else. As long as these two concepts are being um, applied, then this website is taking a, a privacy-related uh, uh, design approach. Say. Now, we're surrounded by so many digital professionals here at the summit, and there are so many big topics and big talking points. So I've got to ask you, what are the big trends that are currently surfacing within that digital marketing, marketing landscape that really excite you at the moment? Sure. So I think that, the uh, first of all, the, the, the idea that uh, first party of first party, party data um, the internet uh, for many years was kind of a, a jungle where data was, as I mentioned before, sold and bought across uh, you know, third parties and created this kind of uh, fra fraction or fracture between the people and, and organization or, or people just don't trust uh, almost uh, uh, many many brands. I think I saw uh, recently uh, the number 75 percent of the of uh, the people that use the internet don't uh, don't trust the websites they uh, they're using, and uh, and I think that what is changing right now is the move from third party uh, data, which means data sites are less using data that they get from all kind of places and more first party data which means they trust uh, they they slowly but surely cre um, collect data uh, from the customers directly asking them questions for example you know you want to watch this video cool but just let me know uh, your gender or where you live or something like that and and slowly slowly they uh, they build on their own uh, their customer view um, which is both, you know, people understand how you, you uh, there, it removes the creepy factor because sometimes people don't understand how can you know something about them if they never told you uh, about it. Um, and, uh, and then they wonder what else you know about them. Um, so with first party data collection, it's, uh, it's something that is more transparent and clear and uh, feels less creepy. They also uh, can, in the My Account page, people 
can see what uh, is being collected about them and even how. Um, so I think this is a, a strong trend that we see. And then, of course, all the marketing around it is, is being based on, on first party data. So for anyone listening to us talk here at home, what are the key takeaways from the book and the points that you really want to hammer home? Um, I think one, one of the interesting uh, points is coming at the, actually at the epilogue, I think. So the book here evolves is also kind of uh, looking more and more into the future. And, you know, in the last chapters, I'm talking about uh, people from re- proactively record more and more data about themselves to improve themselves. And then I talk about uh, how artificial intelligence can is going probably to be used uh, to help and uh, make value out of this data. So what we see is uh, people that are in, that know more about themselves, about you know how they eat, how they sleep, what what how they work out, how they work, when they have good mood, etc. Recording all this data are getting great improvements. And um, on one hand, it it's really cool, yeah, because you know they're even they're saying that they're even happier because they they understand better what makes them uh, sad or happy, and because they they are less biased by all kind of uh, abstractions or psychological you know biases. Uh, and on one hand, this is it sounds it's really cool, and I think uh, you know we will go more as as technology evolves, more of data about us will be recorded, which will enable us to improve our lives. On the other hand, you know, it's a little bit worrying because I think that uh, the more efficient and planned we are, uh, the less we are using our intuition, we're doing less mistakes and making the, you know, supposedly the right choices. But um, I think we will become less unique as, as people and we will need to, uh, to work on uh, maintaining our, you know, intuition abilities, uh, improvisation and just being also keeping you know ourselves more connected to to our, ourselves as human being and not just think about efficiency and productivity that technology will will grab us slowly towards that more and more so what's next for both yourself and indeed gigia is there anything else you can share with us today yeah so i'm pretty much focused now uh, on the work with SAP. And I think that, you know, it's an organization of, uh, I think, 80,000 people or 90,000 people. Um, it's a big change for us, uh, but it's a huge opportunity. I think that for me, the, the goal now is to, to get to the point where we make a change on the internet, which is massive enough to create a standard. Meaning once we get to a point, you know, and again, with the scale of, of SAP, we can do that to a point where, you know, most of the important websites uh, offer uh, tools to their customers that give them, you know, the, the sense of uh, uh, trust and uh, they protect their privacy. Uh, that will become, if we get to a point where this is, you know, big enough, then I think all the rest will need to align. And then, you know, if, I'm a, if we are able to uh, be part of such a change on the internet, I think that will be huge and uh, will be very satisfied. Uh, of course, we're not the only ones who are working on that. Uh, and, and of course, the regulations are helping, are strong, you know, <laughs> a strong uh, force that pushes there. But uh, that, you know, that we see our part there is helping, you know, making this change as a standard on the internet. Now, finally, before I let you go, can I just ask that you remind everyone listening where they can find out more details about your book, if the book has its own website, of course, and also if they just want to find out more information about yourself and Gigia. Thank you. So, obviously, gigia.com is our website. Uh, The book's website is thedigitalidentitycrisis.com, just as one word, no dashes, nothing, thedigitalidentitycrisis.com. And, um, yeah, I'm uh, at Twitter, at truly r-o-o-l-y um happy to hear from you fantastic well thank you very much well i hope you enjoyed the rest of the summit it's been a pleasure talking to you i'd love to get a a read of this book as well because i think the digital are coming on today thank you very much neil it was a pleasure i think facebook are dealing with an absolute pr nightmare at the moment and people are more concerned than ever than about privacy their digital footprint and also their personal data so for me i think it's quite timely that the digital identity crisis has actually been released here at the digital summit 
and it's a real hot topic for everybody. But like I said at the beginning of the show, I think one of the most important things of the book is that with these challenges also comes unprecedented opportunity. And these opportunities will help businesses forge truly personal, longer lasting relationships with their customers, which should bridge both the digital and the physical spheres. So it's certainly worth checking out. So I'd also love to hear your thoughts on this. As always, email me at techblogwriter at outlook.com, tweet me at Neil C. Hughes, and share your expertise, your insights, and your thoughts on this subject too. Now, I am conscious I'm going to be throwing a lot of episodes your way live from the show floor here, so I will take up no more of your time. But I do appreciate you taking the time to tune in. So, as always, a big thank you for listening. And until next time, don't be a stranger. Thanks for listening to the Tech Blog Writer Podcast. Until next time, remember, technology is best when it brings people together.